And now, Thriller Thursdays on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. Chapter 26 The Red Panda was not exactly moving like he was in a tremendous hurry, and he hoped that his companions would take that as a hint. The Flying Squirrel was clearly disgusted by this turn of events, as it was just the side of being captured and then rescued, which she was never one to stand for. But when Pavli had delivered his ultimatum, the Red Panda had not hesitated. He had simply walked to the base of the statue of Anubis, looking for all the world like a man deeply uncertain of how to climb a very tall statue of an ancient god. If she were paying attention, the flying squirrel ought to be able to sense what his reasoning was. Yes, the odds of surviving a hail of gunfire at point-blank range like this was dubious at best, but they had been in worse spots. Still, it was important to pick one's battles. Thatcher's magic was suppressed by the limiter bands, but Pavli was still a wild card with which they were ill-equipped to deal, and they were low on some of their equipment, to be sure. But when it came right down to it, there were two very good reasons to obey Pavli's order and climb up to retrieve the eye. First of all, even if he had done the exact opposite and started a direct confrontation with their enemies, as soon as it was over, assuming they lived, he would just have to climb up and get the thing anyway which made the exercise of refusing seem less than entirely profitable. He was certain that Max would have arrived at the same conclusion, but he wasn't quite as certain about the squirrel. The main reason for his gesture of surrender was that it would distract the guard's attention and give Kit a chance to make a play. He hoped that she would err on the side of subtlety, but it wasn't a tactic for which his partner was renowned. Still, some of that was bluster, he knew that. She was ten inches smaller than he was, and female. Her combat work was excellent, but she didn't immediately come across as the intimidating half of the equation. It was only natural for her to cultivate a reputation as the dangerous one, the unpredictable one, maybe even the one that was a little bit crazier. It was a routine that she played to her advantage. It also wasn't entirely a routine, and he knew that for a fact. He reached the top of the steps without incident and looked up at the statue. He had decided on his play, and if this didn't give her the idea that he was up to something, nothing would. He kept his grapple gun inside his coat and kept his static shoes off. He reached for a finger hold on Anubis's lower leg and hauled himself up, his feet slipping slightly beneath him as he did so. He was an athletic young crime fighter at the top of his game. He could climb the statue without help, couldn't he? Three minutes later, he nearly answered his own question by tumbling down to the stone floor below. This was the dangerous part. He was high enough already to injure himself badly if he fell, and yet not high enough to give himself the necessary reaction time to activate any of his equipment before hitting the ground. There wasn't anything for it but to go even higher, and within a few minutes of work he was at the great god's waist. This was harder work than he had thought but the fact that he had not yet heard pain cries in Arabic mixed with liberal amounts of gunfire suggested that the squirrel was on board for his plan. Whatever it might be. What was rather, he reflected, where all of this fell down, but he was fairly certain that he would think of something. He elected to take a route that would bring him up the statue's back toward the shoulder, and did so for two good reasons. First of all, he would be momentarily out of sight, which would allow him to cheat and save some energy on the slippery surface of the god's torso. Secondly, if he was right, every single one of his enemies on the floor would shift their ground to keep him in sight. With their focus on him, and that much incidental movement going on, he would be astonished if the flying squirrel were anywhere to be seen when he emerged. There were some surprised shouts from the ground at how far he had travelled by the time they had him back in sight, and he tried not to smile. He hauled himself up to Anubis's shoulder and crouched there, as if considering the final stage of his climb, out along the upraised arm. It was not easy to tell from here, especially since he was looking without turning his head, but he certainly couldn't see Kit. He tried to resist the urge to scan the shadows for her, no sense drawing their attention until it was time. Besides, once he was out near the elbow, he should have a full view of the space below. 
The upraised angle of the arm made it necessary for him to shimmy out like he was climbing a tree. Ahead of him, the light from the outstretched hand of the god was more brilliant, and it danced around in every color of the rainbow, casting bright beams far into the darkness. From here the red panda could tell that one beam of white light was stronger than any of the others, but what that could mean he was not certain. At the elbow, the climb got still steeper, and the red panda paused. He was actually feeling a little winded, and this next bit would be tricky even if he used his static shoes. He turned his head just a little, as if he were still focused on his task, and scanned the assembly below. Just as he expected, the flying squirrel was nowhere to be seen. How on earth a group of men could lose track of a girl that looked like that was quite beyond him, but there it was. He shook his head a little, partly in dismissal of his foe's folly, partly to dispel the almost pin-up quality picture of his partner that had sprung unbidden into his mind. These sort of things seem to strike him at the most absurd times. The steady murmur of excited whispers from below that had been building for the last few minutes fell suddenly and totally silent as he completed the last stage of his climb. From Anubis's long wrist, a crimson-gloved hand reached up to the outstretched hand and searched for a grip. Finding one, the red panda pulled himself up at last and dropped forward onto the outstretched palm on his knees. Far below, it was difficult to see much beyond the head and shoulders of the man in the mask at the top of the climb, and as elated as every man was, it was still unexpected when the red panda began to laugh. "'What is going on up there?' Pavli called. "'You've been had, Pavli,' the red panda called. "'We all have. The last laugh by some cunning fiend that died thousands of years ago.' "'Throw down the Eye of Anubis!' Thatcher demanded. "'Do it now!' "'It isn't here, you fool!' the Red Panda said. "'It never was! "'There's an enormous crystal up here, "'with a focused beam of white light coming in from high above. "'It can only be sunlight. "'We must almost be at the peak of the mountain, "'and there has to be an opening to the surface up there, however small.' The crystal is acting like a dozen prisms, breaking the light into colors and scattering it. It looked astonishing from down there, especially after our eyes grow used to the darkness, but it's nothing. He's lying, Thatcher hissed. You're lying! Shut up, Thatcher, Pavley snapped as one might do to a dog. Without his power, the wounded wizard did not command much respect. I'm trying to think. Pavley's eyes fell on Falcone who stood calmly and impassively, knowing that conflict was inevitable, but doing nothing to provoke it or begin it himself. "'Well, Maxwell?' Pavley asked. "'What do you make of this?' The stranger smiled and shrugged. "'They didn't build all of this for nothing,' he said. "'But even if I wanted to help you, I've no ideas to offer.' A thought seemed to strike Pavley. "'You say there is a beam of light coming from the surface?' he called. "'That's what it looks like,' came the reply. "'That would have been a major undertaking,' Pavli said to Thatcher with a smile. "'They never would have done such a thing simply as a trick.' He looked up to the man in the mask. "'Break the beam!' he called. "'Break the beam?' The Red Panda saw where this was going, but elected to play dumb. "'Yes! The light from the surface!' Pavli cried excitedly. "'The light that feeds into the crystal! Interrupt the beam!' "'No, I don't think I will,' the Red Panda called. "'Do it, or I will kill the girl!' Pavli cried, furious. "'You'd have to find her first. came the taunting reply. Pavli and his men realized in that instant that none of them still had the flying squirrel, and they turned quickly, scanning in every direction for her. But she had faded into the shadows. Peals of laughter rang out from above. A swell lot of thieves, the red panda said. Perhaps not, Pavli called, returning his gun to its shoulder holster. But then again... He made a sudden motion with both of his hands, which culminated in a thrust forward toward where the red panda stood high above. 
There was a concentrated blast of wind that blew straight up and hit the masked man like he had been struck by a fist of a giant. He left his feet from the force of the blow, knocked sideways into the palm of Anubis's hand. For an instant, he felt the crystal poke into his chest and knew that he had broken the beam of light, just as Pavli had demanded. But the energy of the blow he had been struck was too great for him to recover quickly, and he could feel his legs dropping off the hand of the god and pulling him out into empty space. This is Thursday Thrillers, audio with action on the Mutual Audio Network. Join us tomorrow on Mutual with Friday Follies, the end of the week collection of comedy cut ups. You can subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed for every day of audio drama that fits your fancy. Or find the Friday Follies feed in your favorite podcast players. Now that's a lot of F's. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.